Tonight again we're going to be in the third chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 38th lesson. We'll be in verses 18 and 19. Now because uh, man has been made in the image of God, <coughs> And possesses a capacity to be in accord with God. The heart and the mind become man's chief resources, personal resources. They're the chief properties of humanity. The heart having the preeminence and then the mind. Both of these have to do with thought perception and expression all of which are sanctified in Christ Amen. Amen. Now, while that may appear very evident to you tonight there are not many people that know this the Christian community is not noted for its thinking it's not noted for its expression and it's not noted for his perception. Everybody knows this. I'm not saying anything that isn't very evident. But this whole circumstance contradicts what God is doing. It's a very serious condition. Salvation is intended to bring human capacities, the chief of which is your thought, heart, and mind, to their optimum. That's what salvation does. Not optimum as the world counts it, but optimum in relation to him. God wants your heart and your mind to be very, very large when it comes to him. Amen. You know that people who understand this Bible, for instance, are very rare, particularly any kind of a broad understanding, kind of a thorough understanding of it. Very rare. But salvation doesn't do this. I want really to be clear about this. This is not the result of salvation. Salvation is going to culminate in us being with the Lord forever. And it's not going to be in just like a listening capacity. We're going to be joint heirs with Christ and reign with Christ and judge the world and angels. See, all of that involves heart and mind. Knowing to this uh, arrangement of things and the priority of the heart and mind, Jesus is very much, has Jesus has very much to do with understanding comprehension, perception, discernment, judgment, evaluation, discretion, and recognition, to name a few. And at some point, God's people have got to kind of have a checkup <laughs> on themselves. Like, how are these qualities? Can God do something and you miss it in your presence and you miss it? That has to do with recognition. Does the hand of God move? Someone has to tell you before you know it? That has to do with perception. When you read God's word, do you just kind of sail on it like a ship on the waters? Or do you let your down net down for a great catch? See, all these these are just things that we have to examine ourselves in. It, we're not talking about finding criti critical errors and things like this. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about coming up to what God expects uh -huh. yes. from his people. See, the inability to recognize truth puts a person in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, I want to especially compliment you. I know that sometimes 
some of the brethren say things that maybe you never heard before, but you but you see it. You kind of recognize it right away. <laughs> That's an excellent sign. That's an excellent sign. Other people hear the same thing you heard, just goes right over their head. They may even find fault with it. I don't think that was right. But the fact that you can recognize truth means you're in the ordained process. You're involved in what God is doing. Or you wouldn't have this sensitivity. The failure of any individual to see God, like see Him clearly, or see Christ, or see salvation, or see the purpose of God, puts a person at risk. Uh -huh. Satan will exploit your ignorance. He'll do it. So if things are not really clear, you'll, and you know whether they are or not, whether some things, when we talk about them, maybe that you just kind of cringe. That just seems to be over my head. Well, you got to get out of that. you got to get out of that because you're at risk if you can't see these things. Maybe you just see, see the outline of it, but that's still in the category of seeing. Yeah, that's right. When you can't see anything, that's blindness. When you just can even see an outline or a shadow, or, that's still seeing. A second touch will do the trick for you. Amen. <laughs> see, if you can't see clearly or understand or perceive or comprehend Christ can't do in you what he wants to do. That's just the way it is. In fact, that's why Paul's praying his prayer. And he's he has a deep interest in the Ephesians, so he's telling them what he's praying about. <laughs> so when it happens, they'll know why. <laughs> you see? I just love it. All right, this is verse 18 and 19. I'm still in his prayer. Verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able. I say may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye, as a plural word, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> it sounds awful large. Now, in this text, we're exposed to a different kind of prayer than most folk are accustomed to. There's a kind of prayer that's described, valid, a valid kind of prayer that's described in Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing. If you're a worry wart, be careful for nothing. A careful means you're fretting about it, worried about it. Be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which will keep your hearts and minds, he continues. Now this kind of prayer, though necessary, is not guaranteed a response, a positive response. You're told the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, nearly all prayers I hear are that kind of prayer. Now you think about it now. You just think about it. That you may hear some exceptions, but almost all prayer requests fall in that category right there. Now I'm going to tell you that's not the highest category. If you don't get out of that category to a higher level, you'll just be a official beggar. That's what it'll amount to. This is not the kind of prayer that moves you to grow. It's the kind of prayer that gets obstacles out of the way 
so you can grow. That's why it gives you peace, see? Because you've got to be in a, to grow, you've got to be in a settled, peaceful state. Yeah, or you can't grow. That's just the way it is. This is not the kind of prayer Paul's praying here. This is a higher prayer. It has to do, it's, it's prayed within the framework, not of the condition of the Ephesians. It's prayed within the framework of God's eternal purpose. Yeah. He's thinking about what God's doing in Christ. That's what's prompted this prayer. Not what the Ephesians ought to be doing, but what God is doing. That's the context of his prayer. So he prays with an acute awareness of what God's doing in Christ. <laughs> I praise that you may be able. Well, these are Christian people now we're talking <laughs> These are people born again we're talking about that they may be able. Amen. Hmm? These are people been born again that they may be able. These are people that have been recreated unto good works that you may be able. These are people that have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise that you may be able. Well, you should be able to recognize all of a sudden that the new creation just doesn't automatically grow. Yeah. Now, I've heard people talk like this is the case. They say, if you're on the vine, you'll bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, this just happens. You can't make it grow, it just grows. Well, see, this isn't so. I'm sorry. No, I'm not really sorry. That's just a, a saying. This isn't the way it is. If it was, there'd be no point to this prayer. The fact that this has to be prayed means this stuff doesn't just happen. Just because you go to church or just because you read your Bible or so, so forth and so forth doesn't mean you're going to be able. That finally you'll just come to the point where it all falls together and you'll be able. That's not the way it is. Other versions read that you might have the power. Or that you might be strong and you might have strength. Or that you might be fully able. Or that you might be strong enough. <laughs> See, the person, he's already told you that for Christ to dwell in your heart by faith, God's got to send the Holy Spirit to strengthen your heart. I mean, he said that to people that were in Christ. He said that the people that have been regenerated. He said that the people that have been born again. They had to be made strong so Christ would stay in their heart. It's marvelous. This means that this ability is not developed by men. It's not how it comes. <laughs> This is why there's such a thing as a novice. See, there'd never be a novice if there's just stuff just... That's why there's such a thing as a novice or a beginner or little children. That's why it's that way. That's why some people can stay a novice for 50 years. Oh, yeah. I know some by name. that are no further along than the nine and ten year old children right here in this assembly. Their grandmas and grandpas. Yeah, I was going to say that the old ch children are further along than they are, yeah. See, what does that mean? Well, it may mean they haven't applied themselves, but it may also mean that they haven't been prayed for. It may also mean that. I will confide in you that I've been in more preachers' meetings than I, than I wish I had been in. Because they are some of the most boring meetings I've ever been in in all my born days. But I have never heard a preacher pray like this text. Not when he's with the congregation, not when they're apart from the congregation, not when we were flat on our face together on the floor. I have never heard a preacher or a teacher pray like this. Now I'm asking myself the question, 
Why is that so? I think it's re yielded results. I think it's because they can't see this. Because I remember when I didn't see it too. <coughs> Spiritual ability or aptitude parallels spiritual understanding. It's like a set of railroad tracks. Your ability can't go further than your understanding. If your understanding is back here, your ability is back here too. If your understanding is up here, your ability is up here. They go together. That you may be able. It says ability and aptitude and expression begin to express themselves. It's the result of the understanding of the individual. Now this isn't, of course, intended to denigrate any lower level of understanding because everyone at some point was there. So we're not going to, but to stay there, that's, what, that's what's wrong, to stay there. That you may be able to do what? <coughs> you may be able to win others. Well, that's a noble ambition, but that, that's, a little, that's premature at this point. That's premature at this point. May be able to comprehend. Other versions say to grasp. Another version uh, says to apprehend. It's almost like chase it down. Another says understand. Another says to explore. I kind of like that. Like you're like Abraham, you had to get in the land before you could walk through it. Completely understand. International English says perceive. One version says take it in. Message Bible says or apprehend and grasp. The Amplified says to comprehend. This now this is heart and mind activity. Comprehension has to do with heart, mind. So before a person can comprehend, <laughs> he has to be strong enough to do so. See, able, you have to be able. You've talked to people, haven't you, that aren't able to comprehend? You've laid it out, it seems so simple to you. They don't see this for sure, and just they can't. Com Why didn't they comprehend it? They're not able. That's right. So I'm praying, Paul says, that you may be able. That's the first. I'm not praying that you comprehend. I'm praying you be able to comprehend. When you're able, then we'll work on the, on the comprehension. Now the word translated comprehend is a big word. Means to lay hold of, <coughs> like a drowning man takes hold of a life preserver. Lay hold of so as to make one's own. So it's not like get a hold of it to get out of the water, then let it go. It's once you got it, you don't not going to let it go. It's like finding a wife. <laughs> you don't aim to have her for a while. You you want to keep her. Whenever someone, you know, something is explained or opened up to them, they'll say, I get it. Now. I get it, yeah. And that, that's, that's what we're talking about. That's right. You get it only with that's this. Right. It doesn't fade. It doesn't leave you. you. You take hold of it, and it's maintained. That's right. You remember when, uh, yes, Sister Barbara, go ahead. I was ahead. considering something that you were speaking about here is to, to have enough strength to keep it. Um, just... In my mind's eye, I was considering someone who is grasps, grasping something yeah. for a long period of time, if their strength wanes, they can't keep that grasp. Yeah, that's right. But I was considering yeah. a man, and I don't remember his name, whose hand clave to his sword. Yeah. That's a picture of what we want, this kind of strength to continue to allow us to keep a hold of these yeah. things. Yeah. Amen. Remember Jesus talked about a scribe of has things new and old in his bag. Remember? 
All right, comprehend means mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you put it in your bag. You own it. That's right. It's yours. Now you can use it. Yeah. See? Yeah. So you know, in the kingdom of God, you know something when you can use it. Right. Now, here was a man in Scripture, David was an expert in use. On one occasion, you may remember, Things weren't going too well, and his own army was going to be retaliating against him and objected. He says, and so he strengthened himself in the Lord. <laughs> Haven't you experienced this? Sometimes there just isn't anybody available, so you, <coughs> you reach in what you own. You can only get what you own. That's right, yeah. But if you've been doing a lot of buying and selling in the kingdom, you can be by, actually by yourself. And no other available people use. That means you, you're able to use what you comprehend, in other words. A while back that someone said, uh, when we can say it, that's now right. we know we got that's it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's a good test for how much, how, how much truth you really can apprehend is how much you can speak about. That's a, that's a good point. Like in our meetings, you know, we get to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. So. I know some people shy away from doing this. I mean, I'm even intimidated myself well, yeah. on expressing myself sometimes, but I figure if I don't say it exactly right, someone else is going to help yeah, finish exactly. it up, mm -hmm. and then my understanding will grow in this. So mm -hmm. it's good to go ahead and express it anyway. That's right. Well, you actually are your own primary student. Mm -hmm. you, lear you learn by what you speak, what you say. You've ever proffered this. Sometimes you say, that's pretty, pretty good. <laughs> and you said it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. You might not have known how well you did, how well you'd actually laid hold of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> comprehend. Because <coughs> you may be able to comprehend, like privately, no. <coughs> with all the saints. Yeah. So this is something... Salvation intends for all the saved to comprehend. Amen. Think of the ultimate comprehension. When Jesus comes again, you want to be able to say that? We have waited for him. Amen. We'll be able to comprehend. When the world begins winding down, some people are going to comprehend. So other people are going to say, well, that's that, that heat index again. There. They won't know what's happening. You may be able to comprehend with all saints. In other words, it isn't all saints doesn't mean you and you and you and you and you. That's not what it means. It means all you together. See, when the more like everybody comprehends, he said ye, the ye, plural, may be able to comprehend. When everybody comprehends, it creates like an, en like an environment in which God can work. Yeah, See, that's how it is. Yeah. You don't feel at home in a stranger's house. God doesn't either. Yeah. So when you all comprehend yeah. in the Lord, he settles in. Yeah. The Lord is among you yeah. or within you, as some yeah. versions put. <coughs> Provoke things. Yeah. <laughs> Some environments provoke good things and other ones provoke bad things. Mm -hmm. uh, in the kingdom of God, every minister is expected to work with this objective. Now, they don't teach you this in college, Bible college. They don't teach this. So you, you may have to be the one that tells it, but this is the truth. If you're going to minister... You got to have this objective in mind to make men all men comprehend. All right, now I can tell you right up front. If there is a missionary that has their objective to be that the people as a whole will comprehend, I haven't met them yet. That's why I mentioned my prayers. That's why I'm concerned when people say we're going to go, we're going to. It sounds really noble, it does, and we're not going to say, don't go. I mean, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is somebody's got to undergird this thing with prayer. 
because this objective's got to be there. You will see very few foreign works where the ye comprehend. We've seen it places we've went. The people in the audience didn't comprehend. It was a major breakthrough if the ministers comprehended. See, that was the way it was. But see, this is the way godly ministers do now. They know what God's intention is for everybody to be able to grasp it, put it in their bag, and use it. <laughs> Maybe able to comprehend. I was going to enlarge a little bit on it. The breadth and length and depth and height. <laughs> so this isn't something like a flat surface we're talking about here. Someone saw the surface of the ocean, you know, and said to his partner, look at all that water. Man, I never saw so much water. He said, yeah, and that's only the top. Yeah, Some people are, they only have this one dimension yeah. view and don't realize there's depth. There's breadth, there's width, there's no way to simply state the profound things to which Paul refers. You just can't explain it. So he uses this dimensional view that you've got to turn your head, you've got to turn the thing around, you've got to walk around Zion, you have to walk through the land, you have to... Per gaze at it, gaze at the glory of God. So in other words, it's big enough to occupy a lot of your attention. And it's not just bulk. <laughs> Every part of it is precious. It's not like a box with several diamonds in it. It's like one humongous diamond yeah. uh -huh. with different facets to view. <laughs> you can't if you take a multi-dimensional object, you can't flatten it and make a single or two-dimension thing and, and properly diagnose it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm, I get the you know, some translations of the Bible try and do this. They got this beautiful cube of revelation, they flatten it, uh -huh. Uh -huh. make it real simple so that children can understand it, but then they just put it out of reach of everybody else. Yeah. The length and breadth, length, depth, height. It isn't that the breadth stands for something, the length stands for something. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is there's more to this than meets the eye. Paul knows that there are divine perspectives about the purpose of God and the work and the comforts of Christ that can't be taught in the kindergarten class. It's just that way. They, in fact, they can't be really taught at anybody's class on earth. People have to be able. Now here, now here's men. They do this in their translation of scriptures and in their comments on the scriptures. They try and reduce it down. They take the source and they reduce it down so people can understand it. God doesn't do this. God starts with the person and makes them able. Yeah. It's, it's a completely different completely different approach. Now, I know you can teach children. I understand that, but there's only so much you can teach them. Children can play, but they can't construct. Yeah. Uh -huh. Someone said, if I only had the energy of that child, well, what would you do? You'd play in a playpen for a couple hours and take a nap. Then you'd get up, play a couple more hours and take a nap, and that's not energy. Yeah. Their energy runs out. You take any one of these children and run them around here, within 20 minutes, they'll be wore out. You don't want that kind of energy. These are just dumb sayings that people pick up along the way. I'm glad to discard them. I don't want that kind of energy. That all you want to do is have fun. I don't want that. I want this energy that makes you capable of discerning what God's planned. Now you hear, you read something, you know, then you try and, if you know God's purpose, you make a conscious endeavor to like fit in it, wonder where this fits in, and generally you'll be you'll be surprised how much satisfaction you'll find. You can, oh yeah, I can, I can see how that fits in here like this. If we're going to reign with Christ, I can see how you got to have 
got to have power. And if you're going to judge the world, you sure have to have discernment. I can see how that fits in, see. But God must empower the person to comprehend, to be able to comprehend. Now he's carrying out his plan and purpose. He needs to empower, make the person capable. In other words, this is too grand for natural, for the natural man to contain. And all God's people have got to get out of the little children category. They've got to get out of that category. Because the little children, they don't fight the devil. They just know that their sins are forgiven. That's about the extent of it. And that does have to be known. But at some point, you're going to have to contend with the adversary. That's when you need strength. That's when you have to know what God's doing. It determines how you battle. So forth. Well, let's get a little deeper into this. What is the thing he's talking about? He says, look, breadth and length and height and depth. What, what is he talking about? And to know the love of Christ. That, that's it. Which passes knowledge. Now we're introduced to the focus of Paul's prayer. I've heard people say, all I know is that Jesus loves me. And I don't say it, but I, so I think I'm, well, that's the one thing you probably don't know. The love of Christ is not like that. But at least, at least, I know he loves me. Well, I'm sorry his love's not on that level. What you should say is at least I kind of see very faintly. But I can, I, I'm convinced he does that the love of Christ, I can, I'm convinced of his reality. But don't ask me to say very much about it. Because I can't really ex tell you much about it. I just can tell you this is there. That's why this prayer is <laughs> That's why this prayer is here. To know. Not know like mathematical tables know. To have knowledge of, or chiefly it means experiential knowledge. As used in Scripture, there's, there's two different kinds of knowing in Scripture. One is intellectual, and one is experiential. There's, the Greeks have two different words for it, which I'll say. But the English word, no, it has two different meanings, too. One is intellectual, and one is experiential. Here's the official English definition of no. To know or to experience. That's, that's, a, that's a definition. But the English just has one word, two meanings. But in the Greek, there's, there's two words with two meanings. The first word, ido, is intellectual knowledge. It's the word Paul says, used when he said, knoweth all things. Well, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. But there's another word, that word intellectual knowledge, knowing the facts sort of thing, is used 668 times in Scripture. But there's another word, gnosko is the word. It's used in our text as a deeper word. Here's the official meaning of it. To learn to know, come to know, get a knowledge of, perceive, feel, Become known, to know, understand, perceive, have knowledge of, to understand, to know. Now here's the, the Jewish idiom for, I, I clean this up a little bit, for relations between man and woman. That's what experience means. For instance, <clears throat> it is written in Scripture that Joseph knew not Mary until she'd brought forth her firstborn. Well, that didn't mean he wasn't acquainted with her. And we shouldn't have to go into any further detail, but it was experiential. With Joseph, it was experienced with Mary. In our text, it's experienced with God. That's the difference. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
It is also used when describing knowing God. They shall all know. That's the word it's used. Mm -hmm. Have experience with me. Be familiar with me. Acquainted with me. Know my ways. So forth. And you might remember that when that love produces something. It is written that Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore him a son. <coughs> After that son, that was Cain. And then again it is written, Adam knew his wife again and she bare a son and called his name Seth. So see, there's a, this kind of knowledge produces when you know the love of Christ, you and Christ produce something. Amen. Something comes from that. Uh -huh. right. Oh, it's marvelous to, <laughs> to ponder. So it's, it's not speaking of intellectual knowledge, mm -hmm. like knowing mathematical tables of the newspaper. It's not being aware of facts. To put it plainly, this has to do with actually experiencing the reality of Christ's love firsthand. Mm -hmm. That's right. Or as Jude mentioned, we can say, I got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. See that? <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a love that produces something. From the experiential point of view, we read, The love of Christ constraineth us. What was this? He, it's a product. See, when you know the love of Christ, this is, you're powerfully constrained. Yeah, what about a person who isn't constrained? They're not, as men would say, motivated to serve God. They have to go to a motivational class. They're not they don't know yeah. the love of Christ. Yeah. That's, what yeah. the, that's what the problem is. They haven't seen it. Yeah. Jesus would say, <laughs> So Christ's love enables you to live solely for him. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. To this end he both died and rose again that we might live unto him that rose, died and rose again. That, to this end he both died and, and is the Lord of the Lord of the living that, he might, that we might live unto him. That's how the love of Christ. So Paul knows this. So he said, I'm praying that you would know the love of Christ. That will resolve a lot of other difficulties and if we address those difficulties one by one we'll just end up coming back next year and addressing them again. Of course you can make a lot of money with seminars like that annual you just come over the thing come over the thing come over the thing that's not what God wants. God knows that this love of Christ is so great it's so profound it's so extensive that if you, if you can see it you'll not have to be motivated again. The love of Christ will constrain you and move you right along. Compels you, in other words, to live solely for Him. Then he adds, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. How's that? Do you know something that can't be known? How's that? Well, it can't be known naturally, but it can be known by God's enablement. <laughs> That's God. God doesn't expect out of you something that leaves Him out. Whatever God requires of you can only be done with God working in you. Both the will and do of his own good pleasure. And that believers don't naturally grow into this. I can see why. I can see why. It's God, I suppose, could have just... I'm not sure this is even so. This is just theorizing that God could just make it so you just kind of gradually when you're in 50 years you just kind of end up but that see the whole process of salvation is wrought out with you and and God linked together at no point do you just un disassociate from God just I'll take it from here Lord I mean it's not like that at all so it passes knowledge but you have to know it anyway you can say well this is out of reach well, says, this is a true saying, it's out of reach. But I can make you able to reach that far. <laughs> See, there were two ways it can be done. He can take these things and bring them to you where you're at. 
where you wouldn't appreciate them. Yeah. Uh -huh. You wouldn't use them properly. You wouldn't. So what he does, he works on. He works on you. Uh -huh. yeah. Makes you able to. <laughs> I like it that way because this is. Brother Ricky talks a lot about satisfaction recently. This is what makes it satisfying. Is you're, is you're able to take hold of it. Passes. Passes knowledge. Camel through the eye of the needle. That's, the that's right. This is impossible. That's God, right. All things are possible. That's, that's what right. said to Mary. That's God, exactly right. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. And see how this glorifies God. So if the thing is done, we know who did it. Yeah. See? So if you're able to comprehend, you don't need someone bragging on you. You just need to praise God that you do. Amen. One of the, the assaults that, that Satan likes to hurl against God's people is that what they have is an imagination. Yeah. yeah. And now this is very confirming to know that if you if you understand anything of God and are able to recognize it, that what you have is more than than an imagination. Amen. It's no imagination at all. It's it's very substance. That only God could could uh, provide. Amen. Remember when Fest, Festus cried out, "Thou art mad!" to Paul, and he said, "I am not mad." He had this. <laughs> he he knew. See, he knew. This is he knew. This is that's a false charge. I'm not mad. He, he had what he he says. I know these things that I'm talking about. Now, to add further perspective to this situation, I'm praying that he would enable you to comprehend so you can know the love of Christ. This process has got to be preceded by the work that he's already described in Ephesians. All spiritual blessings have to be provided. There has to be a choice of God, chose you in Christ. There has to be a predestinated unto adoption. There has you have to be made acceptable in the beloved. You have to have redemption, forgiveness of sins. God has to be abounding towards you in all wisdom and prudence. And it even requires God making known the mystery of his will. All that precedes what we're talking about here. <laughs> you see how big this is. You see why no man can glory in him in works and glory in himself. This is just bigger than that. Additionally, in addition to this, he's told us where he's going with all this. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And then you have to all also know that you've obtained inheritance. Now this is true that in the end, he's going to gather together all things in heaven and all things on earth, then I want to get acquainted with the things in heaven now. If this is how it's all, if this is, if this is how it's all going to work out, then I want to, I want to be acquainted with what I'm going to be gathered to. So talk about dimensions that we've just briefly gone over. It shows you how big this thing is we're talking about. But that's not the end yet. This is still introductory. That, we got another one of the one of those that. That ye, at plural again, that's plural, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> Notice these qualities, that you might be. And uh, he told us before that Christ, that Christ can dwell, that you may be able to comprehend, that, that you may be able to see the love of Christ, understand the love of Christ. See, it's all these conditional clauses that ye might be and I want to draw our attention again to the that the pronoun is plural ye he's talking to the Ephesian congregation we know that Christ assesses congregations we've got an example of seven of them that he assessed in Revelation in the first three chapters so God assesses congregations now, Paul's praying here so Christ can give a good assessment. This very church, 
when Jesus made an assessment, had left his first love. This very church you're reading about here. That's the love of Christ. That's the love of Christ. They left that. So they didn't evidently follow through with this, at least not over a period of time. That you might be sprinkled with some divine traits. The little sprinkling of it. Now I use it the word filled. Ye, plural, as an assembly, filled. That's a unique term in Scripture. No other religion in the world speaks of being filled like this. Heathen religions, you're filled with ecstasy or emotion spills over, but it's not being filled with anything that's what we call cognitive or that you can discern or comprehend. So this is unique uh, to, the, to, the, to the affiliation with Christ. The idea of being filled is that with anything pertaining to God the Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's repulsive to flesh. Flesh can't be filled with this. It'll break the vessel. Now the reason is straight, really straightforward. Flesh is interested in self, but here God is the God is the focal point, not self. God, the fullness of not the fullness of self, not that you might come to your full potential, not that you might get everything I have for you. There may be some element of truth to these, but it's just an element. That you might be filled. Well, you're thinking about God. When you think about things, God's at the God's at the head. When you think about planning God's purposes at the head of things, you might be filled, filled. Satan promoted the idea that ridding oneself of especially wicked tendencies is satisfactory. Of course, all recovery programs, this is it. It isn't really to be anything. It's don't be this or don't be that, and that's what the whole program's about. So that a, a person is a drunk, if he can quit dr drinking, he thinks he's really... But that's not the fullness of God. Amen. That's not what we're talking about here. You remember how Jesus told of a spirit, an unclean spirit that once occupied a a man called a house, and he was, he left the house, I gather he was cast out, wandered around in desert places, he couldn't find a place to settle down. Even demons want to settle down. Yeah. <laughs> and finally he went back to his other house, and Jesus said it was swept, garnished, and his curtains, furniture, but it was empty. Yeah. Well, you said, wait a minute, it said it was garnished, so there was furniture and stuff in it. Yeah, but there wasn't a person wasn't in it. Nobody was really living there. That's what reform does for you. When you strip off all the bad things you did, you finally get rid of them. The house is still empty. It's empty. You got to be, that house has to be filled with all the fullness of God. <coughs> Now let me tell you how some of the other versions read this. Some are, some are helpful. With all manner of fullness which comes from God. Right, that, that neutralizes it a little bit. I'm not sure it's talking about something that comes from God. I think it's talking about God. Completely filled with God. That, that God touches on it. With all manner of fullness which comes from God, the totality of God. That hint said it. God's own standard of completeness. That stinks. The perfect fullness of God, whatever that means. The plentitude of God. With all that God is, that's pretty good. Everything God has for you, the very nature of God. Message Bible said, live full lives, full of the fullness of God. Now here's the idea. There in uh, 
during the days of prophet Elisha, there's a widow that came to him, and her debtor, her the one she was indebted to, came to her and demanded payment. She didn't have any resources, so she was going to have to give her sons to the debtor, and they'd like work off the debt. She asked the prophet to help her, and he said, well, what have you got in the house? Okay. <laughs> it's important. What exactly do you have in your house? Good to think about it, isn't it? Well, she said, I got a small bottle of oil. That, that's good. We can work with that. Now I want you to go to your neighbors and gather all kind of vessels of all sizes and sorts and fill up the house. Not stack them up. Put them out so you can fill them all up. They were a different kind. One was flagons. They'd be like, you know, gallon jugs. Some were small. He said, now you just start pouring and when the last vessel's filled, put a cap on the bottle and go sell that oil. That'll give you enough money. So she filled all the vessels from that little bottle. But the bottle didn't go down. Filled all those bottles, and as soon as she filled the last of the oil, stayed. Or it wouldn't, you could tip the bottle upside down, nothing would come out. It stayed. All right, here's the way it is. That oil is like God. We are like those different vessels, little vessels, big vessels, whatever. Some of just smaller capacities, some of the larger capacities. But whatever capacity you got, it can't be half God, half self. Not even one-tenth God and nine-tenths. Nine-tenths God and one-tenth self. That's got to be the full measure. Whatever's in you has to be God. Filled with all the fullness of God. Of course, before you can be filled with all the fullness of God, you have to comprehend the love of Christ. You have to be able to perceive it. And before you can do that, you've got to be made able to comprehend. Yeah, before you can do that, you've got to be, Christ has to dwell in your heart by faith. And before you can do that, you have to be strengthened with might by spirit in the inner man. <laughs> See? <laughs> this is, so Paul is praying that God himself will bring them along so that more of him can get into them. And when this is true of the assembly, now you got something. Now you got the body of Christ. See, there may be, it's possible to have a church that has 3,000 members, but only 10 of them are members of the body of Christ. Now, this doesn't bother the world, but this would bother us, I think. So we expect people that come here to be wholehearted, wholeheartedly for the Lord. If they aren't there, we'll minister in order to help that to happen. All these are good things. We're not, Amen. we're not talking about things that hurt and things that are painful and things that aren't pleasant. Amen. Not at all. The ministry, true ministry, is to be conducted with this in mind that we've said went over here tonight. Amen. This has got to dominate ministry. It isn't just to tell something, get something off your chest, to try and correct somebody or. This isn't the purpose. The ultimate purpose has got to be so the people end up filled with God. So it can truthfully be said, God is among them. See, it's got to be truthfully said. Think of it being like sanctified spirit, soul, and body. That, that'd be another view of the same thing. Or reckoning yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God. See, that'd be the same thing as being filled with all the fullness of God. Now this makes, doesn't make any difference whether you're the Apostle Paul or maybe you're like a, a ministering woman like Phoebe or maybe an encourager like Barnabas or a helper like Urbane. You don't want to forget Brother Urbane. The ministry is to be conducted so their ministry is to be conducted like Jesus would do it if he was doing it. That's it boils down. So if Orbane is a helper, he's got to help people like Jesus did. 
Paul the Apostle has to teach people like Jesus did. Phoebe has to serve people like Jesus did. Barnabas has to console people like Jesus did. And on down the line, that's what it means. When ye, in other words, now you've got a body of people that are fulfilling works that not one of us could do ourselves. That's what it all works. And he's praying that this will happen. This also is another view of we are complete, we, plural, are complete in him. Not, not I am complete in him because you're not complete without his body. We are complete in him. So to be filled with the fullness of God means that required resources are not sought from any other origin. The Spirit's not quenched. God's not limited like Israel limited the Holy One of Israel. God's not limited. And this is a fullness that will be experienced if the conditions of the prayer are realized. This is how it'll end up. Well, that's something that Paul's prayers. Not, we're not done with it yet. There's still more to this prayer, but it's marvelous, I'll tell you. When you think about what God has prepared for them that love him, <laughs> see, it says I hadn't seen or heard. That. I get, that's true, but see, this is how, what we're reading tonight, this is how you can come to know of it. Mm -hmm. This is how. Pretty soon it kind of begins to dawn on you, and ooh, it gets bigger and bigger, and pretty soon earth's this big. Huh? All right, any of you have something you'd like to add tonight, Brother Ricky? Yeah. To rejoice in Christ Jesus and to put no confidence oh, okay. in the flesh. The, complex, the understanding of the complexities of salvation actually assists us to put our trust in God. Amen. Because Good. this is absolutely impossible. So what the apostle is, is doing, this is this is a, a demonstration of building up a person in the faith. Yeah. Amen. And because uh, you see, there's 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 nobody on earth that can possibly generate this work that God's doing. Amen. You know? Amen. Amen. That's good. Yeah. Anyone else tonight? Yes, Sister Thurston? You know, I was considering at the beginning how you were talking about um, being made able to comprehend yeah. how there are some that think that it, this just happens, that there's not any kind of involvement on our part that I was reminded of what Peter said in Second Peter. He said, Whereby are given unto us exceeding yeah. great and precious promises, yeah. that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, Amen. having escaped the corruption that is in the world. Mm -hmm. But not only this, he said, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance. And he goes on. But it's something that the believer does. The Lord equips us to be yeah. able to add to our faith Therefore, being able to comprehend Amen. the things that were spoken this evening. Amen. Yes, Brother Tony. Uh, when we're joined to the Lord, uh, it's like the picture He gave us, the Lord did, uh, when we're on the vine. Yeah. And uh, so we, it's not just that alone, but we have the husbandman who is uh, yeah. working, yeah. working that vine. So. I, I would think that that's what you were talking about yeah. when you were that the work that the father has <laughs> exactly bringing it. us up to speed. <laughs> um. But he doesn't see in the environment of what we call cognition. As the as the people joined to Christ are enlightened. Otherwise, God's work would not be detected as his work. I mean, you can see that. If God did all this work, but if we are uninformed, we don't see it. But God intends for his work to be seen. It's really dangerous to take, for example, that parable yeah. and just mm -hmm. stand it over here and oh, isolate it from yeah. all the other instruction we've been given. Mm -hmm. so that just, I know. See, you know, I've noticed. I, this is kind of relatively new to me. I notice that these exhortations are not to individuals, they're to a collection of individuals. It's just all of a sudden I, I begin to see that he never talked like this in his personal epistles. Okay, because there's some limitation. Each person has limitations. 
But when you talk about the body, now you're in a, you're in a whole different arena now. Amen. You're in a whole different arena. See, the church was never meant just to operate by a few representatives. This is not this is not God's will. This is not God's purpose. But I don't know of a church as popular as ordinarily conceived that isn't noted noted for a few of its individuals. Just think of the church at Antioch, what a productive church that was. Paul and Barnabas were just a couple of members of that church. <laughs> How would you like I think they have members like that, but they were members of that fellowship. Among they were in their and then when they left, the church didn't fall apart. Yeah. Hmm? Yes? I can see how ignorance of, of what you've spoken about tonight has actually uh, been, the, been the downfall of what we call the church. Yeah. To not see this, it gives rise to self-interest mm -hmm. and divisions and competitions. Mm -hmm. It, whenever, whenever the saints really understand that their connection with Christ automatically puts them in connection with with the rest of His body, yeah, mm. and that uh, that none of us are sufficient to show everything there is about Amen. the Godhead, mm -hmm. that He's placed us in that body mm -hmm. for a particular reason, which will glorify Him. Yeah. Well, then that it it, uh, it, it breeds contentment. Mm -hmm. it, it breeds uh, wanting to advance the brethren and to think of others more than yourself. Yeah. And, and you do all of that under under the umbrella, if you will, of our love for Christ, mm -hmm. which is constraining us in these areas. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. You kind of add some dimension to all things work together for good to them that love God. It kind of enlarges, instead of just focusing on you, see, he uses all things, part of which is his body. Yeah, and in the body, you have not only the not only the proclamation of the truth, you have the demonstration yeah, that's of the right. truth as it's laid down in the saints. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, it's the, it's the demonstration or expression of it that confirms that you got it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, if you get out into space, there's one thing for sure that you'll find out is there's a whole lot more of it than you thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's the same thing in the love of Christ. Yeah, you get right. out there, you start experiencing and knowing Christ, you... you, you You'll never come to a place where you say, "Well, I'm so I seen the width." No, it's wider yeah. than than you know, and it's yeah. deeper than you know. But you'll never know that until you get out in there. And remember, I think it's John fourteen twenty one. He says, "If a man loves me and keeps my words, my Father will love him, yeah. and yeah. I will love him." Amen. That's this. That's this. No, that we're talking about, and I will love him. That's what that's when you know the love of Christ. See? <laughs> yes, Brother Jeremy. You know, I was also thinking here that this this puts a responsibility on each individual to see that they are an important part. They're not important by themselves, but an important part of the body just as an eye would say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm just one eye. Well, you're an important part of the body. So when you are lagging, you've taken away from the body. Mm. And this is, this is a, well, for me, <coughs> it, it makes it um, important to see that everything that each one of us does as individuals does make a difference as a whole. Mm -hmm. And for one person to lag back behind us, it's not good. Amen. Amen. You have to ask yourself, when everything is working well, of course we live in a, <coughs> in a world where, you know, this this can break down because we have disease and we have weaknesses and that sort of thing. 
But I'm talking about if everything was functioning the way it's supposed to, like what body part would you say, hey, I don't have any need That's right, I have no need It wouldn't make any yeah. difference That's if right. it was your eyebrows, you know. Uh -huh. and That's and right. You want to keep it all. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. All right, we'll have a closing prayer.